learn everything you can learn, you know. So somebody calls you on the phone, says, I got this gig for you, but you have to play funk music or you have to play some Dixieland or you have to play. I say, learn it all because you, you know, it's all going to pay your rent after a while. And, and if possible, have another thing you can do. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Cobb. Hello. When I say that name, Jimmy, it's so exciting because when Kinda Blue came out and there's a young artist starting to hear jazz and listen to it, that album and the way you played spoke to thousands and thousands of drummers to open up to a whole new way of thinking. So it really was still to this day being studied as you are still being studied. So I thank you so much for joining us, Jimmy. Uh, so the little guys tell me every time I meet somebody, they tell me he started playing music, listening to that record, you know. So that's always very nice to hear. How inspiring that the energy of how every musician was talking to each other was just profound. Yeah, well, they, they was all my partners. You know, we was all partners together. So, yeah. I, And I'm the only one left, so. Well, yes, you're, holding, yes. you're holding it down for sure. Well, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> Where did drumming start for you? Where did music start in your life when you were younger? Well, listen, when I was about 14, I ran into some boy, some guy in the neighborhood, you know, was a little older than me, yeah. that uh, used to just go around, and he wasn't really a drummer himself, but he used to just go around and bang on the table with his fingers, probably like what you see the guys doing in the street with buckets and all that stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he got me interested in doing it. So for some reason or another, I had uh, all the jazz music in the neighborhood, seems like, because I, I don't know how I acquired it, but uh, yeah. I had it, you know. Wow. I, used to, I used to play it all day when I wasn't going to school or, or after school, you know, like that. And everybody used to come to my room, I mean, to my little place, and uh, we sit up and listen to the music. What kind of music was it? Dixieland. Yeah. I wasn't listening to Dixie, but that's... You know, it was in that era. Yeah. And then it was swing, you know, when they had all the big bands. Yeah. Comic Dorsey, Dylan Miller, you know, that's all big bands, about 30 of them. Yeah. You know, so like I used to listen to that because that's all they would play on the radio, you know. Mm. Like then, then, then came Bebop, and I started to listen to Bebop, you know. There was only one guy that would play the Bebop music, uh, you know, on the radio. Because I don't know, I guess people wasn't too familiar with it, and uh, and his name was Symphony Sid. You ever hear that name? Yes, yeah. Symphony Sid. Yeah. And he used to come on like at twelve o'clock midnight and stay on till six o'clock in the morning, because <laughs> that's the time they gave him new. Because they was playing Glenn Miller and all that other stuff, you know. And the Glenn Miller music was more commercial music to a certain Yeah, commercial music. When bebop hit, that must have been completely different. It was completely different, you know, yeah. like a. They were doing different stuff with the changes and, you know, with the structures of the tunes and all of that. Yeah. They did something was uh, unauthorized, you know, <laughs> in the music business, you know, like Juilliard. At the time, Juilliard wouldn't let people play uh, jazz. If you played jazz when you went there, they put you out of school. Really? Yeah, yeah. So it was a long time before Juilliard got the jazz, but that's jumping ahead. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, I, what it was... This guy got me interested in playing the drums, you know, from coming to my house listening to records and we beating on the table with our knuckles and stuff, you know. <laughs> so I thought I wanted to play. I, I got a little job that I had. I used to go like from school to this job. This job started like at four o'clock. I got out at three, go to the job at four, work to 12, you know, and then go home and listen to Symphony City at six <laughs> o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I never hardly ever got back to school after that. <laughs> Whenever I got back to school, I would sleep through all the classes. You know? <laughs> you know, but this is the guy, he got me interested in the drum, so occasionally to be walking downtown in Washington, D.C., where I was born, and there was a, a drum store called Ratner's, Ratner's Drum Store, you know. And I used to walk by, and there was a picture of Gene Cooper, and the one that's looking crazy, you know, yeah, yeah. sitting over the drums, you know. Yeah. So I went in and I was just inquiring about the drums. I asked the man, I says, uh, how, how much is your drum? So he, he told me, he said, uh, you got the money? I said, no. <laughs> I said, but it seems like he wanted to sell me the drum. So he said, well, he said, you got a job? 
I said, yeah, I got a job. He said, well, i tell you what. He said, it seems like you want the drums. And I was thinking to him, I said, it seems like you want to sell them to me. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh, I'll put whatever little money you can bring me down. You know, every week in this drawer here, and uh, when you get enough money, I'll give you the drums. So that's how it happened with me buying the drums, you know. So before that, I was just around beating up my mother's tables and stuff <laughs> with forks and all that stuff. So she said, well, no, you can't keep doing that. So you saved the money from the job. From the job. Paid this guy a little bit of money each yeah. week. Yeah. And then you were able to get the drum set. Yeah. There wasn't a whole lot of money I was making either. I think back then I was making like $27 a week. <laughs> <laughs> So I used to bring this guy like 20 of it, you know, yeah. till I got the drums, you know, which was probably three, four hundred dollars at that time. Yeah. So I got the drums and when I really figured I was going to play them, you know, I had to, I really dropped out of school because, because I, whenever I could get there, you know, I'd go to sleep through all the classes. <laughs> I said, this is not that good either. So yeah. I said, I best just go and just get with the drums, you know, and let that be your, what's going to take care of me, you know. So you did that, you get the drum set. Yeah. Did you start taking some lessons or practicing? How did yeah, you... well, on one occasion I ran into one professional drummer who was a, the youngest drummer in the, the National Symphony Orchestra in Washington. I wanted to take some snare drum lessons from him, you know, because them guys have pretty good, you know, technique playing yeah, the drums. Yeah. So I talked with him, he said, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you some lessons. What you can do for me is just get me some more students, you know, so, so we kind of did that for a while, I don't know. I don't even remember if I ever got him a student. <laughs> but, you know, we started out as long as uh, he was in town or I was in town. Jack Dene, his name was Dene, and he was the youngest, youngest drummer in that band at the time. Uh, so we, we did that for a while, and then I played around Washington when I, get so, when I got so I could play a tune, you know. I used to play with different guys around Washington, which was a lot of guys around there was very prominent because during that time I was doing the war, mm. you know, like four days, you know, something like that. Yeah. I used to play with older guys because, of, you know, most of the good musicians were gone to the war, you know, yeah. to be in the war. So I played with the ones that, that was 4F or, you know, couldn't go, <laughs> you know, so, that, so I got a lot of experience with them guys. And what kind of music were you playing? Dance music or parties? What well, was this? I was playing like whatever it was, like back then it was like, Rhythm and blues, mm. you know, you played backbeats and shuffles and stuff like that. Yeah. So I played that, and yeah, I was listening to Symphony Sid every night, <laughs> listening to the guys, what they were doing, you know. Like that, I was playing whatever came up that I thought I could handle, you know. Yeah. So, which was good, you know, because that's good for you. So when did you start getting more involved as a professional drummer? When did it, when did it get serious? Well, listen, actually I worked in Washington from the time, from the time I started. To, to, to the time I could play a little, I worked around there with, with different little bands, you know, yeah. like uh, I worked with uh, with Charlie Rouse. You know Charlie Rouse? Yeah, sure. Charlie Rouse had a band. Uh, he had a friend that had a bar on on the main street in Washington, 14th and U. And he uh, had a room upstairs that he said was empty, and he wanted his friend, who was Rouse, to bring something in. And, uh, you know, so you bring a little band. I You know, bring a little band, you can... Uh, play whatever you want, you know, so he say, okay. So he took a bebop band up there, Was we had a quintet. We played bebop music, because I learned all of the bebop tunes from, uh, from Rouse, because yeah. Rouse had been with, with Dizzy's band, wow. Dizzy Gillespie's band, he learned all the bebop tunes, so he used to play all of them, so I learned all of them from him, you know, which was one of the better times of my life, you know, because I learned all those tunes easy, you know, I had to play them every night. How do you figure it came so easy to you? Well, I don't know. It's just something I, you know, I felt I, I like to do. You know, I used to hear, say, we used to listen to Billy Eckstein's band, mm. which had all the, all the real top uh, dance musicians that you would ever know probably mm. came through that band. Yeah. That band, or maybe Earl Hines, probably Earl Hines first because Dizzy had been with Earl Hines' band. Before, yeah, before, yeah, you yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so all the guys came out of that band. Like Sarah Vaughn was like, uh, you know, she she was in that in that band some at one time or another. What a singer, Then she yeah. went with Billy Eckstein. Yeah. Yeah. So then a lot of those guys, Dizzy was with, with Charlie Parker. So long ago, man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was a young one named uh, 
that played the baritone. I think he probably popularized the jazz baritone. And uh, he was probably was the youngest guy in the band, too. Interesting. And uh, his name will come up, too. I used to work with him. And uh, there was another guy who was old, about as old as I am, but had a lot of musical knowledge, you know. Mm. So he, he could write arrangements and stuff, you know. So he put, a, put together a band sometime, and I worked with him. And that kind of taught me how to read, read the charts, you know. Yeah. yeah so uh, doing all those little things, you know, you, things to get together to bring you, like Miles Davis used to say, the music just crept into my body. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing that you, so you were pulling different information and knowledge and studying the instrument kind of as you were going along. Yeah, well, you know, everything is a learning thing. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you play with the older guys and they got, you know, they know some older tunes that you probably wouldn't have come across yeah. had you not played with them, you know. Yeah, yeah. So you you got that that information, and they had some information about the stuff way before me. Yeah. And the drummers, you know, I get that information about the drummers. Yeah. Like Sid Catlett and, uh, you know, guys like that. Did yeah. you know you know Sid Catlett? I had never met Sid Catlett, but, yeah. but you mentioned these names, Sid Catlett and even like yeah. Chick Webb and these guys. Chick Webb, were, yeah. From those early days, they really kind of were the beginning of the drum set players. Yeah. You know, in the early days. And these are names... That as the viewers watch this, yeah. that's really what I want them to do is the research. When you mention yeah. a name like Sid Catlett, I want them to do the research of who yeah. Sid Catlett was. Because, Buddy Rich. And Buddy Rich, absolutely. And, yeah. and you mentioned Gene Krupa. Gene, Gene Krupa, Krupa was a showman that when he, yeah. he, yeah. When he played the yeah. movement and yeah. the drama and the excitement, he really kind of made our instrument of drum set that's right. a real fun thing to want to be involved with. That's right. So here you are now, you're influenced by these guys, and you're hearing them play now, you're, you're still in the, in the Washington area? Yeah, I was sitting there, and then they, they had a thing in Washington, you know, like as I say, after I got to learn how to play a little bit, I used to try to go to the clubs. I couldn't get into most of them, you know, I would go and try to peep in the door, or, you know, something like that. Yeah. And I saw like Lionel Hampton's band, I had a lot of black bands at the time. You know, yeah, like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now they had about six, eight, ten of those, you know. Wow. So, and then they had a, a theater that I used to the, book things every week. You know, they used to have a different band, like I have a show. Yeah. You know, have tap dancers, singers, and all that. Wow, so, wow. So they would start like on a Friday and then the end of Thursday. So I got a chance to see all all kind of bands coming to that, that situation. Yeah. Then there was another place that on Sunday that it was like a hockey rink or something, you know, like a... You used to have hockey games in there. Yeah. But on Sunday, they, they would have a, a band, like maybe Glenn Miller, you know, one of the really, really, really big bands. Yeah, you know, yeah. So at any occasion that I could, I'd go see whoever I wanted to see in that situation. So was, was there a lot of live music going on at that time? Yeah. In the ghetto, there was a few clubs that would book Lesser Young. Yeah. And his band would bring him down for the weekend or something yeah. like that. And that was a big band. No, a little band. Lesser had, Young had a small, had a small band, group. Yeah. Interesting. This is still had a big band there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but that that band used to come there sometime too in another place that they had that could have big bands. You know, that was in the ghetto. So you're hearing you're hearing big bands. You're hearing smaller group bands. You're hearing you know some swing music. You're hearing some bebop. Yeah. I mean, you're really kind of getting a, a this congestion of all this great music. Yeah, I'm wide open. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm ready for all of them. I know? like that. I'm yeah. wide open. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I listen to everybody. You know, did, um, like I said, I did that for a while until I, I was about uh, 21, you know, and I had a friend who lived in Port Chester, New York. His name was Keeter Betts. You know that name? No, I don't. Yeah. Well, Keeter was a bass player, a great bass player. Yeah. And he was working with a band called Earl Bostic. You know that name? Yeah, that name. Yeah. yeah. So they came to town. He used to come to town with a group from from Portchester and play in a place that was right around the corner from the main theater, you know, the Howard Theater. Yes. Where they used to book the things I was just mentioning. Yes. The lady was smart enough to put a trio in there, so like when the guys got through playing, they want to come around and jam. There was a rhythm section there, you know, so that's what happened, guys. You used to get through with the theater, come around there and jam, jam all night, and I used to go check them out. That's, yeah. I met a lot of guys like that, you know. So I, I learned from a lot of guys like that. Mm. Getting back to Earl Bostic and Keita Betts. Keita Betts was working with Earl Bostic. Mm. 
And uh, he came to town once and uh, after we got to be friends and said, uh, our drummer's about to quit. Uh, you know, you, you want to wanna go on the road? I said, yeah, man. <laughs> he said, he, he hooked me up with Earl Bostic. And I left New York when I was 21 years old and joined Earl, Earl Bostic's band in this town at 125th Street <laughs> in St. Nicholas Avenue. <laughs> right there, I went on the road. When I drove all over the country, you know, they had a car and a van that carried the instruments yeah. and stuff, you know. And I drove in the car with Earl Bostic, you know. So now you're, now you're traveling throughout the nation? Are you driving? I'm you're doing down. one-nighters? What are you doing? One-nighters. Really? We're doing one-nighters, you know, like uh, all over the place, you know, like from New York to California. Unbelievable. Yeah. At any given time, you know, like that. And who, who booked this? Was there someone that was booking these dates? It was uh, Ben, ben Bart. I think his name was Ben Barr. Yeah. And he had, he had Donna Washington, I think. Interesting. And uh, so that's what the, the thing was with Donna Washington and Earl Bostick. What a great musician. This yeah. is incredible. Yeah. yeah. When uh, Donna sang, our rhythm section had to play for her. Keita and me had to play for her. Yeah. She had her own piano player. And her, her, her piano player was Wynton Kelly. Oh, really? You believe that? <laughs> Absolutely. That's what you ended up playing with later on on Kind of Blue, yeah? Yeah. yeah. yeah we, we spent almost the rest of our lives playing together you know, uh. like after that. When she sang, we would, we would have a trio where we went and uh, Keita and myself, you know? Wow. Like you said, it turned out to be a, her first real trio that she had. Yeah. So we did that for a while. I did that for about four or five years. And me and Donna got to be friends, so... It was like that. I then I used to travel travel around with her, and that got me introduced to a lot of people that I probably wouldn't have met had I not been with her. You know? Absolutely. So the yeah. networking was musicians were working with each other. You're meeting. Yeah. You're touring. You're going from club to club. You're driving together. Yeah. So you know that's a it's a learning thing. You know, like yeah. first time I'd been out of Washington to see all the rest of the country. Yeah. You know, and that was really wonderful too. You know, and you know to drive. And just see it like that, you know, it's, it's very, very nice. So you're able to experience what's happening in the, the New York East Coast scene. Yeah. You're going down south and playing some down south. Going through south. Midwest, West Coast. Yeah, yeah all of it. I had, I had never been no further than uh, La Plata, Maryland, which is like 30 miles south. <laughs> so where did it happen now where, where you met up with Miles? Oh, this is that's way down the line when I met up with Miles. I, when, while I was still working with Dinah, we were working in a theater in Philadelphia. Hmm. Symphony Sid had a program where he, the guys he played on, on his, uh, his broadcasting, he would get two or three of them together, put them together, and bring them out and tour some theaters, you know. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Call, it, call it Symphony Sid All-Stars. So at, but when, at this situation, we had to, our rhythm section had to play with them because they didn't have a rhythm section. So this time Sid brought out Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, Mill Jackson, and Toots Tillman. Oh, Toots, man. Toots, Toots had just came from Belgium. Yeah. And he, was, he, had, he, he wasn't even playing the harmonica, harmonica yet. He was still playing the guitar. guitar. Oh, is that amazing? I think he came, had, had come to town to work with Joe Sharing or something. Yes, like yes, yes. So when they went on, we had to, our rhythm section I had to play with them. And at that time, our rhythm section was, it wasn't Winton. This time it was uh, Keita, me, and Burl Booker. Burl Booker, you probably don't know because don't know she's, Burl, uh, yeah. she's uh, from the Philadelphia area. Yeah. She was, she's a good female piano player, though. So you were the kind of the house band then. Yeah, we yeah, yeah. The Symphony Sid All Stars. Yeah. Wow. So what, what was that like you playing with you know, Charlie Parker? I mean, this is, oh, it must, it must have been incredible. It's a magic that says as good as you can get with your clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> as good as it gets with your clothes on. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so like, uh, you know, we used to do that. In fact, I kind of remember some of the tunes they were playing. Like, Miles used to play like a, a move or something like this. Dub, 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 that one. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Bird used to play some kind of blues. He said he would play a different kind of blues. And I remember Mill Jackson used to play The Devil in the Deep Blues. Scene. Yeah. And I forget what Tush was playing, but he hadn't written none of those tunes that he was famous for yet. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, so we did that for five days. And then on the last day, we had to go and play in Camden because the theater doesn't work on Philly on Sunday. 
So we had to go to New Jersey. So the theaters were closed down. You had to yeah. drive to Jersey. Yeah, they played. After that, I kind of got working around in New York. When working around New York, you probably work with anybody yeah. that calls you up, you know? Yeah. I think me and Horace Silvers had a duo gig once, just piano drums in a <laughs> hotel lobby somewhere <laughs> on 46th Street or something like that. I remember that. You know, so just things, just things, you so know. So you're just playing any kind of gigs, any things, you're any kind meeting of gigs new gigs. guys, you're touching base with yeah. what's happening. Yeah. But there were a lot of clubs at that time, right? There were a lot of, there were a lot of places. Yeah, it was a lot, New York was jumping then, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you, when I look at the names, I mean, my gosh, Clark Terry, you mentioned Donna Washington, Pearl Bailey, Coltrane, Sarah Vaughan, Billy Holiday, Wes Montgomery, yeah. Ron Carter, Nancy Wilson, Bill Evans. I mean, you have had this incredible deep core of these, these are the, 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 the core of the musicians that have changed music for as we know it now today. Yeah. And you were right there in the thick of it, Jimmy. You were right yeah, there. Yeah, I was, you know, lucky enough to JB in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And well, you had to have the talent to be able to hold it up, which you did. Billy Holiday I worked with when I was still in Washington. Right. Because uh, she had a piano player that, uh, that she worked was going to Howard University. Right. So while he was down there, he put together a little, little quartet. I used to work with him with that. Right. So when she came to town, he just brought the, the bass player and myself and the piano player. And he was the piano player. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we worked with her in that, in that top, one of the high class places on 14th Street called the Blue Mirror. Yeah. For two weeks. You know, and I was about 18 years old. What was it like? I mean, Billie Holiday is the name that, you know, for those of us that, that loved jazz and, and the, the American history music, Billie Holiday's name, what was it about when she was singing that was so magical about her? I don't know. She was just one of the first ones to come around that everybody liked, you know, sort of like Aretha Franklin and somebody, not that style, you know, yeah, but yeah. Prom how prominent they got after Fashion Nova. Yeah. She was like the first one because she was like in some white bands. Yeah, when it wasn't popular, you know. To do that, right, right, yeah. right, right. She just happened to be the one she would into the jazz thing, yeah. too, you know. So yeah, 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 yeah. Just one of the first ones. Like maybe Lena Horn a little later. A little later on, Lena Horn, yeah. And then later even that, Nancy Wilson. Yeah, she was working in, a, I think her boyfriend had a band there that and he was a trumpet player or something mm. like that. And yeah. I, I went by to see them one day and I met her and she was telling me. You know, that she was a singer, and she knew that I had been with Dinah, you know, so she wanted to talk to me. So yeah, yeah. We went through that stuff, and she was telling me how good she could sing and all that. So I said, yeah, <laughs> you really can sing as good as, as Dinah Washington and Sarah Vaughan? And she said, yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> and so that's when I met her. She hadn't, hadn't left town yet. Like, oh, and another one, another singer, while well, I'm thinking about singers, was, was Ruth Brown. Ruth Brown, wow. Ruth Brown is from, uh, was from down south. Yeah. And, I, and we used to be in the place in Washington called the Caverns. Now, you, do you know that place? No, I didn't know they know. The place was like downstairs in the basement, and it was kind of built like to try to make it all like a look cave on the inside cabin. like it looked like a cave. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, so like, and the lady that ran the place, was her name was Blanche Calloway. It was Cap Calloway's sister. Oh, interesting. Yeah. She wound up being Ruth Brown's manager. In fact, she brought her. So that place to sing, that's where I met her. That's incredible. You know, so I play, play for her. Boy, I love all these little connections yeah, that have been on. Yeah, that's, that's, kind of, that's how it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now here you get to Kind of Blue. It's 1959. John Coltrane, Cannonball Adderley, Bill Evans and Winton were both trading off on keyboards on that. Paul yeah. Chambers, what, what was that like? You recorded oh, that? that was wonderful. That was beautiful. Uh, what happened with uh, the two piano players in there? Miles wanted one particular thing. He wanted the, the tune to sound like the blues. He wanted Winton to do it because he knew Winton could do it best. Yeah. And then what he liked about Bill was that he loved Bill because he used to call Bill up and says, "Oh, put the phone, put the phone on the on the piano and play for me." You know. So, <laughs> so Bill would put the piano right on your side, just playing. And he'd sit there and listen to him. With the know? telephone right there. Yeah, with the telephone. <laughs> You know, so that's that's how tight they were. Gill too, like Gill. Gill, when the Miles made a record, he made it a good record, and it was Bill Gill's arrangement. And I never knew that huh. until till Ray right later, until yeah. I got to meet Gill. You know? Yeah, great yeah. stuff, great stuff. So, kind of blue. You recorded the album. What was the recording session like? 
Well, listen, I just I got there first. I think I was setting up because by that at that time you were bringing the drums to all these things, you know. After that, they had drums in the studio. They supplied them later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, they said, never the guy started to come in, and you know, I'm in a place. The bass player's in a place, and the horns are in a place. This is like in a Third Street at Columbia Studio, you know, mm-hmm. which was a converted church or something that they brought, you know, some guys in and, and fixed it up so it sounded as good as it did. You know? Nice, nice. Because they used to make all kind of recordings in there. So we were there, and the, then the guys came in, and Miles had some paper, something like that. He just handed them some paper, so, and maybe they had done something in his house, you know. But I had, you know, I had, maybe the bass player you know, yeah, yeah. and Bill and them that had done something. I didn't know nothing about it. He just come and say, well, this is three, four, this is straight ahead, you know, it's just like that. You know, like Paul was in a place like baffled, you know, yeah. with some stuff around it so he wouldn't feed into the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Then the piano was in some place with, with a cloth or something over so it, the rest of the band wouldn't feed into that, you know, so, <laughs> so like we was all like separated, kind of separated from each other, but yeah. so to get the right sound at the end of the engineers one. He just come in, that's, that's, that's how simple it was. It know? was that simple, so I guess he really trusted your playing. Yeah. And the respect that was obviously for every musician that was there. Yeah, well he knew it, he, that's how he picked people, you know. If I throw something at a guy and I don't get nothing back, I know I, I know I can't use it. You that's know? the last time you're gonna work so with that, him, right? That's how it works. So he, he knew what everybody could do. Yeah. So we just, you know, just told him what it what it was, you know. That's how they performed it. Well, Most of you, those songs was like a one take. One take. Yeah. What, what what is amazing is the communication between the musicians and the amount of listening that you all were doing. That was it was just so beautifully played. Yeah. And if those were first takes. Yeah. That really is profound. Yeah. To have that level of artistry at such a high level, that beautifully done, that has lasted the sense of time. Well, we had been playing together, you know, he knew that uh he knew we could play together. Yeah, you know? yeah, so yeah. He just brought something but that was different at that time. Yeah. You know, for for us to play. So but he knew he trusted all of us to do it, you know. Well, you know, you you've gone on. I mean, when I think about looking at the list of people that you've that you've played with, I mean, it really is amazing. West Montgomery and 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 just you know with Coltrane, I mean, you really have had this incredible array of artists that you've met and performed with. Yes, just being at the right place at the right time. Yeah. So, uh, Train, I, I met in that band, you know, mm. in Miles' band, because he was there when I got there. There was one time that Miles had. Two tenor players. I was in the band then, but I used to go see him. Yeah. He used to say, have Sonny Rollins and Coltrane. Oh, really? Yes. At that time, Sonny Rollins was a saxophone colossus, you know, <laughs> like uh, everybody wanted to play like Sonny Rollins. You yeah. Know? So, like, uh, every night, train would get beat up. Oh, really? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and Miles used to just play the play the song and go sit down and watch them go. To, you, know? <laughs> you know, he's, he's evil like that. <laughs> so, so Train, you know, I guess Train got to say, oh man, I'm tired of getting beat up like this. <laughs> so I guess he says, figured he better figure out something on his own, get, get him across, you know, get, 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 him, get him through. So he did that. That's powerful. He That's finally, he thing. worked on it until he got it together. Yeah. yeah. You got to get it until you can feel Sonny. <laughs> well, well that's, which is amazing because, you know, Sonny and Coltrane, they're, they're different styles yeah, of how they play. Yeah. But that, I guess that competitiveness was very healthy at the time. Yeah. I don't think Sonny was trying to do nothing. He's just being natural. Yeah. Just yeah. playing, you know. Yeah. Were there drummers that you were listening to at all that you were at oh, that yeah. time? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of guys. There's a few guys that had been in band. Arthur Taylor. Art Taylor, you yeah. Know Art Taylor, yeah. yeah. Philly Joe. Philly Joe, what a... I, fo- I followed Joe, you know. Really? Yeah, I was nervous to do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I knew Kenny Clark. Kenny Clark, beautiful player. And I knew, I knew most of the drummers, man. In fact, I got a, a T-shirt home there with about 100 drummers on, on the back of it that a guy put out, and I think I knew all of them. That's amazing. Yeah. Nice. You know, it's with these musicians that are, that are watching us here, and 
the names that you're mentioning and all these fantastic legends that you've performed with and the legend yourself, I, I want them to do the research, to go back and, and research and listen to some of these musicians and get to know what was really happening at this time when the music was magic at this time. Yeah. There was so much going on. Yeah, people bring up names to me that I've forgotten. Yeah. And that brings up stories that I'd have forgotten about them. Yeah. You know, so like uh, a lot of times uh, that's what happens where it gets me, gets me to remember some of those things that I've, I had forgotten, you know. Yeah. I met Johnny Mathis when he was, uh, he just started, you know, because uh, when we worked in the Black Hawk out there with Miles' band, yeah. he used to come by because the, one of the owner's wives was his, his manager, you know. Hmm. So she used to come up. She came up to us after we had uh, played one night and said, uh, could, my, could my boy sing, sing something with y'all? You know, she don't care. We had been on a stand. We started out with a, with a, a stand-up comedian, Slappy White, you know what that is? Slappy White, Slappy absolutely. Slappy White. Yeah. Slappy White used to do like 10, <laughs> 15 minutes, you know, to warm the people up. Yeah. Then the trio would come on and play a couple of tunes, you know, then we'd bring... Miles and the rest of the band up, you know. So like after we did all of this and got to the thing, she wanted Johnny Mathis to come up and sing. And he must have been a kid at that time, right? Yeah, he was. He yeah. was still in school or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. So the piano player said, "Wait a minute, man. We've been up here two hours already, and this lady wants us to play some more." <laughs> you know. So we let it, they let let him sing. So the piano player. This, Went and took him out after one chorus. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh. then a little later, after he got famous, I said, see, boy? <laughs> I say, you can't just take everybody out in one chorus. <laughs> yeah, but he's still singing, man. He's still singing. Yeah. Sounds fantastic. Sounding good, too. Beautiful voice, beautiful yeah. voice, yeah. You know, in, in closing, we have these musicians that are out here that are listening to your stories and, and going back and researching the history of these great musicians and yourself, what message, Jimmy, would you tell this next generation about, about pursuing their dreams about playing music? Listen, learn everything you can learn, you know, so somebody calls you on the phone and says, I got this gig for you, but you have to play uh, some funk music or you have to play some Dixieland or you have to play, I say, learn it all because you, you know, it's all gonna pay your rent after a while. And, you know, if you don't know it, you just can't take the gig, right? You know, right. so like I tell them, while you're in school, learn everything you can learn, and if possible, have another thing you can do. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> or you know, if you go out of town somewhere, have some family there. <laughs> you know, if you guys ask me, say, Lord, man, should I come to New York? I say, yeah, yeah. If you got some money and uh, you got some family there, <laughs> you know, the case the case don't go right. You know, you got somewhere to be. Yeah. And you know somewhere to stay to, to to get after this thing, you know, because that ain't easy, you know. It's, you have to stay with it. You have to love it and stay with it. It's amazing that you loved it. You stayed with it. Your passion is still as strong than ever. Yeah. And you are the legend that has led many of us drummers down a path that has been much clearer for us. We have learned from you, Jimmy, and we have stolen from you because you've inspired us all. And you continue to inspire us all. So I'm a thief too. <laughs> <laughs> so for all them guys. One thief to another thief. <laughs> I thank you so much, Jimmy. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Man.